government is a military government which will rule with advice from certain eminent civilians in the country. I would like to emphasize immediately that this coup was not initiated by the armed forces merely to satisfy our selfish ends. And I said, this is man's inhumanity to man. So to me, because you are talking to me, that was a great justification for the coup of 1972. That was going to be his last meal. I would have prepared one of his favorite food, which is a roasted mash cocoa yam with peanut or granite mixed with um, red palm oil. Father, take this ring, pray for me that God may accept me as I am. This way is the last way. The military was his hidden passion. I think he got it. You see, the, the philosophers have been saying that there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. I think the time has come for the world to know the real General Ignatius Kutuma Chapel. In the early hours of 13 January 1972, the nation woke up to a new dawn, a new voice and a new leader. As Lieutenant Ignatius Kutue Champon announced on Radio Ghana that he was the new head of state of the Republic. Good morning fellow Ghanaians. This is Lieutenant I.K. Champon. I bring you good tidings. Buzo's hypocrisy has been detected. We in the armed forces have today taken over government from Buzia and his ruling Progress Party. With immediate effect, the constitution is redrawn. Parliament is dissolved. The Progress Party and all political parties are banned. Dr. Kofi Abrifa Buzia is removed from office. The leader of the opposition is dismissed. All members of government and parliament should report at the nearest police station for their own safety. Senior military officers responsible for internal security operations in the regions who take over government property at the residences. Please stay by your radios for further announcements. God be with you. Incidentally, a champion had announced his rank as Lieutenant Colonel, not knowing that just the day before his coup, the Chief of Defense Staff had authorized his promotion to Colonel. It was at the studio that a colleague prompted him of his new rank. So he had not been informed formally that he's been promoted. People were thinking because of the lack of promotion, that's why he did the coup with us. People tried to explain why he organized the coup, but I think that was the least of his concerns. The fact that he wasn't promoted, even if he was frustrated with that, he never shared that with his close friends and his family, so I dismissed that kind of argument. I think genuinely uh, he didn't know that he had been promoted, so he announced himself first time on the radio when he sees government that I am Lieutenant Colonel Kutu uh, Echampo. Then of course one of his officers reminded himself, just yesterday we were promoted <laughs> as a, a full colonel, so then he corrected himself. So these are small things, small anomaly. So I left Accra. On the 12th of January 1972. And then, at dawn of January 13th, 1972, my attention was drawn to the coup which had been made by Kenyan Achampo. And um, furthermore, after making the coup, he was anxious to talk to me. He said, 
because the officers who received this call from Agra said that he wanted to talk to me. And I think before he made that call to me, he had already announced that I would be his chief of defense staff. So when he got me on the telephone on the 13th, I told him, thank you, Yakoboski. I'll be coming to Accra in the late afternoon and I would like to meet you. I arrived at Accra and went to look for him but couldn't find him. And it was the next day, the 14th, that I met with Ika Champo in Bermaka. And he told me that he had appointed me the chief of the Pressar and would like me to accept. I said to him, good, I would like to think of it, and I would give him my reply. And I went away, and it took me two days to give him my response, which was in the affirmative. And I did this because I wanted to find out what the public opinion was, or what people were thinking of the vote, or how the vote would happen, because I wouldn't be able to plan it. And in trying to do so, I consulted the late IGP Harley, I consulted Mr. Debu, Commissioner of Police for Police Security, I consulted my family. But the last person I consulted was Chief Justice Apollo. In fact, he asked to see me because he was living not very far from my residence. And when I went to see him, he said to me, Ashley, I know how you feel. I know that you will not like to take this job. But when you look at the guys who are involved in this school, like a champo, a colonel, and three majors, you see that the coup will not generate a lot of public confidence in them. So I would like you, I do, I know you don't feel like taking it to take the appointment and see how things will develop from there on. So I thanked him and accepted the appointment. And the next day, went to Bemakam to meet Aika Chelko to tell him that, okay, the Akubosil, I will accept your appointment. Air Vice Marshal General Ashley Larson is the only surviving member of a Champions NRC cabinet of 1972, who later became his Chief of Defense Staff CDS. As seen on the screen, he was sitting at the right hand side of General Champon when he gave reasons for his bloodless coup. The government is a military government which will rule with advice from certain eminent civilians in the country. I would like to emphasize immediately that this coup was not initiated by the armed forces merely to satisfy our selfish ends. As I said in my earlier broadcasts, the takeover was occasioned principally by the hypocrisy of the Buzia regime coupled with the inefficient management by that regime of our economy. The malpractices which existed before the 1966 coup are still with us and there was no prospect of seeing an end of them. Matters got steadily worse, especially in the economic field, and it became obvious that the Bolivian government had no clue as to how to arrest the position. In simple terms, we are almost like a nation at war without an external enemy. The National Redemption Council has therefore decided to place the economy of Ghana on a war footing. We are soldiers, we know one way of dealing with crisis situations, and that is action. I want to ensure the nation that we shall aspire, we shall spare no effort, and no sacrifice will be too great for us in this gigantic task of winning a great economic war. I was 
Conference Art of Ghana, attending the National Defense Force in India. And um, so I cannot say for sure that um, all what he said concerning what Buzia was doing actually did take place. But I know before I left for India that Buzia's policy was beginning to affect some of our benefits in the military which most officers didn't like. And I can champion repeated this as one of the reasons why they also made it school. He named the National Redemption Council, NRC, as a new government under his leadership. On the first day, he mentioned five names as members of his council. On the second day, he expanded it to turn, and on the fifth day, he added two more. Well, the NRC government, when it was formed, had a chamber as the uh, head of government, and then they had his three accomplices, namely Lieutenant General Agu, oh no, Major Agu, Major Bar of the 5th Battalion, Tony Sellerman of the Reconnaissance Squadron Regiment, and um, those were the three officers who were part of the coup. And um, I came in as the Chief of Defense Staff. And even before I came in, uh, other officers had gone into the job, some from the Navy, some from the Air Force, which I commanded, but I didn't know of it. And then I had to advise Ike that um, I think all those officers must leave the government. And let's keep your three accomplices. You also have to move the service commanders who were also then in this government, because it was bad for security for all of us to be on the council, leaving the Macam there. So, they agreed and we moved all the service commanders back to their jobs and we retained the three accomplices. And then after that, we appointed Mr. Ian Moore, a lawyer, as the Attorney General, Mr. Kobler of the Ghana Police as the IGP Commissioner of, uh, 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 of Police as the IGP, um, and then two other officers, Colonel Benny and Colonel Ferry. Benny became the officer in charge of security, and Ferry became the foreign minister. That was as a champion sought to avoid counter coups, some loyalists of the dethroned Progress Party government also planned to organize a resistance. They included Ministers Reginald R. Aponsa, K.G. Ose Bunsu, Chief S.D. Dumbo, and the General Secretary of the Progress Party, B.D. Darocha. The idea was to mobilize party faithfuls for demonstrations in Accra and Kumasi. But unfortunately, it failed because the main avenues for public communication at the time were already under the control of the military. The success of a champion's coup without spilling blood suggested a lot of planning went into it. Addis believed he started plotting against Buzia barely six months into his government. If you say that champion started plotting barely six months after Buzia uh, came to power, uh, again, you have to question that a bit because six months will be too early for anyone, especially if you have been recommended by a FIFA to be the main protector of the government. But then again, you have to also understand that within the very, uh, I think within eight months to twelve months of Buzi's government, the first year, Buzi had undertaken certain policies that were disliked by the champion personally. The aliens compliance order that he saw to his enforcement in a flow, the Apollo 587, which also affected many of his uh, friends from the Volta region, uh, officers in the military. Uh, so these two incidents could have been all of them happening within the first uh, 
eight months or so of Buzia's government could have influenced him. But certainly, I believe it was beyond the six months. So it's not a wrong statement to make. But if you say within the first year, I think it's more of a solid argument to make than this, than to say within the first six months. Initially, of course, any coup that occurs, you can get all the soldiers supporting you. But because there are so many plots against Buzia, I think generally the soldiers were happy. But then again, those who were the plotters were not too happy because he preempted their own plots. You know. uh, but in the end, a champion was able to gain their support just simply by appealing to them and getting almost all the senior officers to be with him. So it, it became a fair complete. All the soldiers had to back him once he was in full control of the situation. Uh, I will not sit here supporting a coup d'etat because uh, coup d'etat that uh, discards uh, democracy or democratic system that we try to uh, foster will not be acceptable. Was it necessary? Not really. Champon had no grounds uh, to, to organize a coup. I mean, all his grievances, those that are recounted in the book, could have been legitimated to him. On the other hand, if you look at the hardships of the country, especially towards the end of December 71, when the devaluation of the currency occurred to the tune of 33 or so percent, that sent uh, prices of all items to the country skyrocketed. That, for the citizens, was no reason for the coup. You see, but I don't think we need to push that argument because that would be dangerous for any civilian government. Civilian governments make decisions or policies to save situations. A lot of people didn't realize that to stage a coup or to be part of a coup, by the time once you hear, you've heard it with your ears, you're already guilty. Okay, so. Before the day of the coup, I, 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 I you see, sometimes uh, it is said that you don't blow your own horn. But the truth of the matter is that if I'm holding the trumpet, who should blow it for me? <laughs> I should blow my own trumpet. You know, so I like to correct in this interview, I like to correct a lot of uh, things that people didn't know. That on the, on the before the coup, the day before the coup, I went stood before the adjutant and told him we were staging a coup the following day. And that I want the keys to the armory. And then I had briefed all the various groups in my in the unit, what they were to do on that day. You know, and Agbo, Major Agbo, he was supposed to take the, over the airport. I was communicating with him, sending reinforcements to him and various things. And the, the gentleman was to cut the telephone lines. I took him to uh, 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 T-Junction, Labadi T-Junction. I took the first gentleman there and uh, when I spoke to him, uh, he, he was fair colored like the gentleman behind the camera. In fact, he, became, he was becoming redder and redder every time and I was afraid he was going to collapse on my, on my <laughs> in the car. And I brought him back. He said, Joel, this one I can't do it, please. <laughs> let, let, I, 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 let me tell you the truth about it. I said, oh, let, let it go. Then I took another gentleman, uh, he's called Aloteanan. Uh, then as for him, what I told him was that we knew or wherever your, your, your family house was. So <laughs> if you if I was arrested, that was signal that we should kill all of them. But in fact, I, I didn't know where his family house was. His, 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 uh, his, 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 this thing where we started shaking. And he said, I'll do it, leave my family alone. And in fact, he did it. Then I called my staff sergeant to my house. And I said, start turning. Tomorrow this is going to happen. Oh, they start turning. All oh, his eyes just went red when he got to his unit. Until he asked permission for three days, he, he went. He was out of the country. When the things were seen, I came and saw him with a rifle at the 
check with. I said, is that you? He said, mm. <laughs> Hey, and yeah, and that for me, I said, my, my friend, he's not, he's not, he's not here to, to, to say that you want to take part in the book. I will advise you to get involved because the day you say you want to get involved in the, in the book, that day you sign your death warrant. You've caused the rubbish. You've crossed the Rubicon. The Champion Bloody School comes with a lot of unanswered questions. For instance, how was it possible that he was able to plan and execute a Bloody School at the blind side of the intelligence community? So, on the actual day, the officer who was asked to go and take over the Flagstaff house, the officer was nowhere to be found. So, a champion, uh, at that time it was a colonel, Colonel Achampon and, and uh, Major Bedu, they came to Reiki because I was literally controlling the, the operation from my end. Then they said, then Achampon came and said, Oh, Joel, uh, Flag Surface has, has not been taken. The officer will come find him. I don't want to mention the name of the officer, to his senior officer. So, then I said, oh, don't worry, I will send a, a company through the uh, 37. In those days, it, it used to be, it was not a runabout. So I will send a, some, a company through there, and I will go through the switchback group. So by the time the company arrived, I alone, with my driver, with one ferret, we, we entered Flagstaff House. Then I jumped out of the, out, out of the ferret. And then I started shouting. I said, no matter who you are, I want you to come to where I'm standing. Put your arms on the right and lie down. And I'm counting 10. By the time I finish counting 10, if you are not here, you have yourself to blame. And you know, you remember, God said, let be, there be light. And there was light. So let there be a booming from Captain Chua Kwame Su. And there was a booming. And they obeyed. The call came, including General Kufu, who became the head of state. So when they came, it was when they were lying down before the company arrived. And the officer who was supposed to take over also arrived. And he was senior to me, even though he was senior to me. I started, you know, blocking him. So, you were not, you were supposed to have taken this place and you were no, no one to be found. Reiki, we don't hold the ground, so now you can take over. The field battalion of infantry, uh, 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 the company was here, so take over, I'm going. So General Kufo came and he said, where are you going to take me? I said, I'm going to take you to Gonda Barracks. And then I, I, said, I, I asked for one of the land to come. I opened the door, I saluted him, gave him the proper compliments as a senior officer. He sat in front and I closed the door. And I said, sir, I won't escort you. You are a gentleman. Driver, take him to As head of state, he had his moment with his friends and family. I talk about Jack Shesku and Mongutu. Those are the ones that I quite remember now first one was Nikolai, the late Nikolai Johnson's group of women, he came on a state visit. Unknown to the system, we had developed a dark room in the castle where we developed pictures, I think. So he came, and the last day of his state visit, he had a press conference in the castle. My cameraman was there to pictures. As soon as he took enough, he came to the dark room to develop the pictures. We were building an album of the two-day visit. So on the way to the airport, they were able to fix the pictures of the press conference, which had ended just about 45 minutes earlier, into the album. So at the airport, when we drove there, the head of state, General Champong, of blessed memory, if I'm allowed to say that, presented his counter. The album of his visit, they were going to. Then they saw that the press conference pictures 
which were taken just about 45 minutes ago, was the pictures were in the album. They looked at each other and they were in disbelief. So when they came, to, when we came back, the uh, team came back to the castle and uh, they were reviewing things. The late Roger Feli, who really liked me because of how I was handling the job of a lieutenant general, told the meeting, Chairman, I think Anamamba will be confirmed for what he has done. So, Chairman Champion well, this is the demand of the Commissioner for Foreign Affairs, so it shall be done. So I was confirmed as the press secretary because of the charges with the business. The most interesting story he shared with us was when he was working as a teacher, he studied through correspondent course to be a stenographer. He said he studied through the night and then in the morning he would get up and go to school to teach. The visit of Mobutu Sesesuku Mbedu Azabanda. He came and he, he was a character. No, everybody knew about his wealth and his power. And his, his work, he was a handsome man too. He really lived the power. And as someone said, in him, you could transform palpable dread into something else that you will know that it is not only notional, notional fear, but palpable dread. You can you can really touch it. That was cool. So it came and I had to introduce the press to him. So I said, Your Excellency, President Mobutu Sisesuku, Guku. Was a banger. He looked at me and looked at us and they looked at it again. Then he was so admired me that no, I, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. This is the signature of I Achampong when he donated this a copy of this book, which is um, uh, two years in office of Kenyatta Achampo. And this was my copy of that document. And there is a signature, I put a champion, signed, and the date is 13th January 1974. And I also, when I received it, I can't see myself now go there and I signed as it was the 13th January. As if he knew, he had less time on earth. Through his gifts and inspiring words, he left his mark in the memories of his children. I, I think uh, he gave me a, a ring, because um, I find that this Ashanti custom that uh, if your son looks like you, he's inherited your spirit or something of that sort, so you need to do something to symbolize. Uh, so he gave me a ring uh, which had inscription from IK, which was his initial, to my initials AK with love and blessing and yes that was a ring that I I really sort of kept I never took it off you know and even when we used to play football at school people used to say that was why I was scoring goals but I was naturally very good athletic anyway but um, I kept that ring until I think we unfortunately we lost it when we went to the UK when we were burgled um, but that's the favorite gift he ever gave me. The greatest gift he gave me was a signed picture of himself as a head of state with his famous green pen. He was always full of humor. He had a good sense of humor, and um, whenever we were going out, whether to school or travel wherever we were, we'd always go and see him and tell him where we're going, knowing that you know he'll give us some transport money or some money to leave. And then he had this way of like, you know, he said, you know, Papa Miko, then he said, okay, Unu And we were standing there waiting for him, you know, you know, to give us money or whatever, and like you said, oh, no, you know. So, yeah, he had, he had a good sense of humor that way. Hey, this was in Kumasi. Okay. When 
he said, Jewel, everybody is talking well about you. Otu Ofo Okukuwari is praising you to the highest heaven. But your own people, when we want to give you something, they say, hey, if you bring this man, you come and sack all of us. And I said to him, you know what? What I had to stay the coup, to make you president, I still have it. Then I went that time, he told some few people that, hey, it's a captain, so who's wrong with you in Uganda? Jakobowski is the name of an actor in the Soviet, in the Russian film, the principal actor in the Russian film, which both of us watched when we were young officers in the Mets, and that was many, many years ago. I'm talking of late 1959, getting to 1960. And after that film, we decided to call ourselves Jakobowski or Jakobowski. That's, that's all right. Above all, he was a good storyteller too. No, he wanted to make us feel comfortable around him. So he was able to tease us in, our, in his film. And so he said that in one village, a people teacher managed to get some money. He wanted, he had bought a new suit. So he wanted the, the village cameraman to take a picture of him so that you can always see that he had a suit one time in his life. So he went to the studio. This kind of camera would prefer not like your your cameraman uh, who is you know just handling the camera. The way you, you had to put your head in under a cloth and look into a pinball thing structure with a tripod of some nondescript current. <laughs> you know, so that was what you had to look into to take the picture. Unfortunately, after all that, the, the cameraman took it. Snapshot. So when he delivered the picture, then the, the teacher was furious. My kids got up to shoot, trousers, shoot, thin tight. What can we have? And they make you half. We couldn't contain ourselves. You know? Yes, I wanted a full picture. You give me a half, how do I pay? And he paid half. That you should have seen general. Even though he knew the story, because he wanted to get an engender us to enjoy the job, we were all laughed together. Oh, it's good too for us. No, to me, he was he was a father. There was no limit to his humility. He called me once. He said, and asked me, Anaman, how's your front? How, how, the press front? How are you managing it? So, I don't know. I said. I don't know what came out. I said, well, my friends often use the word energy. And uh, they tease me with that. You know, but the thing is that I can assure you, sir, that even the, pres the American presidents have their speeches written for them. But they practice it. They own the speeches. They read through and do research before they come to the lectern to deliver. So when they come to the lectern, they sound as if when they are teleprompters and as if they are reciting it. But these are scripts written by speechwriters for them. But if you do not go through that route, then it can be a bit jerky. So what's your advice? So if you don't mind, I have the late, I mentioned the late John Hammond, one of the f best news readers this country ever produced. I said, John Hammond is my friend, just like Mike Egan. And if, if you don't mind, I can suggest it to him. So on your major, major speeches, he could come and do what they call it. Uh, they would have done in these other countries. So then, okay, if that's what you say, if that's what will make your job easy, why not? So I went to John Hammond and told him that. 
John, this is what I have for you. Really? Are you sure? I said, yes. This is what I told him. I don't know what came over me. I said I should come and invite him. So he came several times to help him with it. The, his speeches and that energy thing, energy thing was nailed to the collaboration between John Hammond of Blessed Memory and General Ignatius of also of Blessed Memory. I have had the life by the grace of God to be here to, to, to make you aware of some of these things that he did in the background to make Ghana look slightly different. Shortly after becoming head of state, a champion was met with an immediate challenge to bring back Dr. Kwame Nkrumah from self-exile. Some CPP lawyer is told a champion has stitched the coup to bring him back, but these told had to be countered. So the NRC released an official statement to the Daily Graphic, which was published in early March 1972 to set a record straight with a screaming headline, Coup not for Nkrumah. Barely two months after, Nkrumah passed away on 27th April 1972 in Bucharest, Romania. Even though it was a sad event, but Nkrumah's death came with a challenge and a test for Ghana's foreign relations, particularly with West African neighbors because of the aliens' compliance order by the Buzia administration. Neighboring countries harbored strong ill feeling and resented Ghanaians for maltreating their citizens. Uh, again, Buzia's policy was to try to get rid of Indians who were here illegally. And at the time, millions of West Africans had been to the country without legal papers. So in a, on one hand, it was an attempt to uh, get rid of uh, illegal immigrants in the country. On the other hand, because Africa, West Africa have this kind of inter strong network of relationships, uh, it affected mostly Nigerians and Ivorians and a few such people. And in the context of African unity, which was the mantra for Nkrumah's government, Buzia's policy to expel the undocumented uh, aliens in the country uh, was uh, more or less seen uh, with uh, serious reservations by most progressive Africans. And uh, I think that uh, Champon played a role in that. Because as a young officer, he was sent to the Flower border with his soldiers to keep order at the border crossing for these departing so-called aliens. And, uh, what he witnessed, what he saw there, became part of a burden on him that may have even influenced him to organize that group. Because the experiences at the border was so scandalous, he couldn't just take it. The Guinean president, Ahmed Secretary, who made Nkrumah honorary co-president in Guinea was so angry that after Nkrumah's death, he didn't want to release the body to Ghanaians because he felt Nkrumah was betrayed by his own people. In spite of his difficult times, a champion being a man of honor had earlier sent Nkrumah's son, Francis Nkrumah, to Romania to bring back his alien father home for further treatment. Upon his return, he informed a champion that his father was not in good condition to travel. Therefore, his father's wish was for his body to be buried in his hometown. Yeah, I think uh, champion worked so hard to bring uh, Nkrumah's body back to the country uh, for some reasons. First, you know, as I said, Nkrumah may have saved a champion uh, from being dismissed from the armed forces, from the military, back in 1959. So I think that registered very strongly on the mind of a champion. And secondly, if you look at the champion's policies, in many ways, they resemble the uh, Nkrumah's own policies, in the area of African uh, politics, in the area of uh, promoting internal development, except that Nkrumah favored the state controlling the economy, whereas a champion favored ind indigenous Ghanaians uh, controlling the economy. Uh, besides that, there were very striking similarities between the vision of a champion and, and, uh, and Nkrumah. So it wasn't a surprise that when he, Nkrumah died in Guinea, where he died in Romania, the body was brought to Guinea, and Sekutiri wanted to bury him permanently in Guinea. 
But uh, Champon persisted and sent emissaries and made appeals to sovereign leaders like uh, the leader of Nigeria at the time and uh, the leader of Liberia and other places to convince the Kituri to finally release the body. Because you see, interestingly, when Nkrumah was sick and dying in Romania, a champion sent his son, Dr. Francis Nkrumah, who is still alive, to Romania to bring the body back to Ghana for the father to die here. But when Francis went, according to the story, and this story was told by the personal secretary of the champion, who is still alive, because he witnessed the preparation of uh, Francis to make the trip, and when he came back to report, he was present. Uh, when he went, when Francis went to Romania, I think Ma was so sick, the doctors advised against flying such a sick person back. But Nkrumah made one request to Francis, to a champion, that when he dies, he wants his body to be buried in his hometown in Rofo. And I think that was so powerful for a champion that he could not stand uh, allowing Secretary to have his way on that and engage Secretary to family he won and brought the body here and buried him in Nkrofo as Nkrumah had wished. Finally, after two months of several negotiations, the champion granted Kwame Nkrumah's wish. And so, on July 7, 1972, Nkrumah's body was brought home. As a visionary leader, he introduced the principles of redemption, which outlines six point revolutionary agenda aimed at making Ghana a transformed modern nation. They included the following. One, one nation, one people, one destiny. Two, manpower development and deployment. Three, revolutionary discipline. Four, principle of self-reliance. Five, service to the people. And finally, number six, mobilization of the spiritual, intellectual, and world power of the people. This revolutionary charter is not only a guide to those who lead our nation in government, in business, in thought and in culture, but also constitutes the basic tenets that must inspire every man, woman and child in Ghana. For faithfully and diligently adhere to, the principles of the charter will usher in for all of us and for generations of Ghanaians and born, a truly progressive, self-reliant, prosperous and confident nation of one people with one great destiny. really patriotic in a way, he loved his country and he felt that uh, all Ghanaians should be guided by certain principles that were set out in the Charter of Redemption. So if you read that chapter, uh, that charter, you, you find those principles that he believed would be helpful for Ghanaians to build our character as Ghanaians, to deepen our love for our country and to be really uh, to gain some kind of dignity as Ghanaians, as Africans. That is the basis of the charter. Or well, unfortunately, it didn't stand. And, uh, you know, like in most other good things that uh, happened in Ghana in the end, they fizzle out. But if you go back to read the charter, I'm sure you will like him for at least proposing those uh, ideals for Ghanaians. A champion's patriotic spirit was truly unique. He once told the media not to tarnish the image of Ghana for personal glory. Uh, we are not saying that those who um, contribute articles to foreign press are not pathetic. We are not saying that. At least you can earn some foreign exchange when you go on holidays, you go to a nice hotel and enjoy yourself. But what we are saying is that don't destroy your country. If you know what you are, you are writing is wrong, don't do it because you do your country more harm than good.
And this is all the foreign press want. They, they don't want any developing country to come up to their standard. This you must accept. And once they, they can use you to destroy your own country, so much the better for them. But if, if, if any generalist continues, these people we are talking about, very soon I ask the Commissioner for Minister of Affairs to read uh, a gist of what, uh, uh, and the AG of what they have done. And you agree with me, some of them were given several warnings. The moment you give a warning, that warning appears on the TV, on the uh, GBC, um, uh, BBC, or in the, in the paper in, uh, in, uh, in overseas, in overseas paper. So we are saying that you are free to write whatever you want. You can criticize the government, then we will set up. But don't destroy. See, when you know what you are writing is wrong, it isn't it is true and it's meant to subvert, to create disaffection, to create confusion in the country, then you are doing more harm than good. Because if the country collapses, you are within it. It doesn't collapse for me or for the colleagues. All of us are inside. It's just like uh, people travel, traveling on a ship. If the ship sinks, we all sink. Uh, uh, if the ship sinks, we all sink with it. This is what most of them don't understand. They think they are outside the government. The government is an, a separate entity somewhere. If it is destroyed, fine. He always had a problem with people. In fact, if you listen to the tape again, he referred to people who get paid from media organizations outside in foreign exchange and therefore have the means to pay and holidays and enjoy the money. He has no problem with that. Everybody should find his gig. But don't be led into a situation which will put your own country down so that you will earn more and more change. That one is a small problem. Says, if we have a head, come up with the right solutions. Let's debate. We will put it through the system. Let us address it. Don't let us uh, exhibit our feelings outside so that you can earn. I think that was a principle He simply wanted Ghanaians to believe in the country. Therefore, he needed to condition the minds of the people towards patriotism. He began by approving new levels for the National Pledge and the National Anthem. In 1973, he introduced the National Pledge, which begins with, I promise on my honor to be faithful and loyal to Ghana, my motherland. It was required for school children to recite it every morning before classes commenced. His love for the National Pledge was deep to the extent that he even got his two daughters, Grace and Gladys, to join the school children who sang it on national TV after every news broadcast. In 1974, he approved the new lyrics of the National Anthem, which was originally composed by Felix Beho and adopted at independence in 1957. Felix Beho's version began with the lyrics left high the flag of Ghana, but the new lyrics, which was adopted in 1974, began with the lyrics God bless our homeland Ghana. In 2009, a Ghanaian by the name Michael Kwame Bodroy, a university research scientist in Germany, returned to the country to lay claim over the authorship. He yes, uh, as again part of the uh, charter of redemption was to revise the national anthem to be more patriotic. If you know, you realize that the immediate post independence uh, national anthem was written by Philip Beho. Uh, but it started with the line Lift High the Flag of Ghana. A champion version that still stands today is the one that starts with God bless our homeland, Ghana. And he also introduced the National Pledge that all school kids were to recite every morning before they started classes. That was his, uh, his uh, attempt to get Ghanaians to be patriotic, to develop deep, 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 deep love for our country. Another major concern of the NRC government was how they were going to manage Ghana's debt, which was $300 million then, a huge amount at the time. The NRC decided to find ways to stall, if not completely avoid such payment. Therefore, it segmented the approaches to debt obligations into two. First was to rearrange the payment of those found to be legitimate, and secondly, to identify debt that was illegitimate. Further, as part of his plans to strengthen the Ghanaian city, Ichampo nullified the Buzia devaluation 
in a public broadcast, he ordered the Bank of Ghana to deal at the rate of one new city equals 78 US cents. In other words, the regime had revalued by 42%. Though this action strengthened the city superficially to give temporary respite to the pricing of some locally produced items. Oh, the, 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 the city was priced from almost one to one. In fact, when I was leaving Ghana back in 1977, uh, I changed just a few $50 uh, as pocket money. Yeah, I bought it for, at the time it was 1.27 for one dollar. You see, so for my $50, I got just around $60. For, for my uh, $50, I had to pay just about 60 cities to buy at the time. The economy was quite strong at the time. But of course, we know that during these last two years, things went a little bit off track and uh, we experienced all kinds of uh, difficulties. But those difficulties were mostly socio-economic. Uh, 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 the city was still strong even after he was overthrown or during the last few years. Just that the, the Kalabule and other kinds of social vices that became the mantra for Muslims really derailed whatever gains uh, he may have made in his initial years. And his inability to control that, to manage the economy at the time, was of course part of his undoing. But overall, I think he was quite an effective leader. After outlining the principles of the NLC, his government decided to scrutinize a number of contracts that were signed by the Buzi administration. In doing so, some contracts were classified illegal. However, a champion in a public broadcast on February 5 announced the immediate repudiation of some $94.4 million of Ghana's debt, which amounted to a third of the total debt. The action was indeed radical. The first time the nation stood against foreign creditors in such a public way, for radicals or nationalists, this was a refreshing policy in economic relations. The debt repudiation announcement was carried with a screaming headline by Daily Graphic in a pointed and blunt Akan language expression, Yintria, meaning we won't pay. According to Cameron Diodu, editor of the paper at the time, the editorial staff saw the mood of the nation and decided to reflect it in that provocative headline. It is also important to note it was under Champions regime that Ghana never went to the International Monetary Fund IMF for any financial grant. If you look at how he was able to stand up against the IMF and the other international monetary institutions, the fact that he was the only government or his was the only government that never borrowed a penny from anywhere from Nkrumah till today. He is the only leader who never borrowed. The fact that he put the weight of the state behind indigenous entrepreneurs hoping that they will become the centers of development in their various industries for the nation. If you look at all these kind of uh, initiatives, not to mention Operation Feed Yourself and the other things that he did, then you cannot help but admire this person in terms of his vision for the country. As part of his policies on building Ghanaian businesses, a champion's NLC government fully supported Ghanaians who showed promise in entrepreneurship, particularly those with established businesses. The thought of a champion's aim of developing Ghanaian entrepreneurs was not just a dream, but it was a reality. He introduced policies including tax holidays, sovereign guarantees, and other incentives that led to the emergence of a number of burdened local entrepreneurs. Among some of the local entrepreneurs to benefit from a champion vision was Edward Osebwachi, whose Boachi mattress became a foremost manufacturer of Jilazi mattresses in West Africa. Boachi put out the first private modern hospital in Cantonment which would later be seized years later and turned into a police hospital by the Jerry Rollins PNDC military regime. Another major businessman to emerge was Benjamin Aponsa Mesa, popularly known as B.A. Mesa, who established the International Tobacco Ghana Limited that produced the Rotman's king-sized cigarettes. Also impressive 
as an entrepreneur was Joshua Kwabnasian, who in 1973 opened the largest plant in West Africa. Sian's brewery produced the Tata beer for the local market and exported Maltex, a soft drink to nearly all other West African countries. In 1974, the champion went to Kofrodia to inaugurate the first intravenous infusion company in the country. It was established by Samuel Christian Appenty in partnership with a Swiss investor. In the late 1960s, Appenty Salt Industries, Pambro Salt Industries Limited, and Vacuum Salt Product Company were producing not only to the local market but was also exporting to the rest of West Africa. Car assembling also gained prominence in the economy as two entrepreneurs got a full backing of a champion's regime. The first was Mark Coffey, who established the Mark Coffey Engineering Company. The company assembled Mazda car brand. His company had 200 Ghanaian employees. Kofi Ousu was a businessman in the car industry. He was the owner of the first Ghanaian-owned car assembly plant, Kowus. Kowus was to make VW Golf a popular brand in the country. Champo uh, uh, was also very, very interested in uh, indigenizing the economy. You know, he had a very interesting mantra. Uh, the Ghanaians should capture the commanding house of the economy. And that meant that we have to develop Ghanaian entrepreneurs, Ghanaian capitalists, if you will. So he deliberately supported Ghanaians who were showing promise to become big industrialists. It was during this time that uh, 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 Siam set up the biggest uh, brewery in, uh, in Ghana, the biggest brewery in West Africa, uh, which was uh, the Tata brewery that he set up. It so was during his time that uh, Ghanaians started assembling vehicles, like uh, Kubus Motors, assembling Volkswagen. He encouraged uh, Ghanaian business to be flourishing. He helped um, Tata Brewery, Kubus Motors, and then as you carried um, sugar plantation, and also in Saum Canary. Industry, what did it be uh, uh, manufacturing in Ghana? I mean, there was Akasama like TV, there was uh, Sanyo TV, we had Dioplan buses, Ulubu uh, buses, um, cars, we manufactured Mazda, Nissan. I mean, what did you produce in Ghana? I mean, uh, everything was produced in Ghana. Everything was produced in Ghana. And yet, we are not taking money from anybody, from any bank or anything. We can't owe anybody. We run the country totally by itself, on itself, with itself. To improve public transportation, Kennedy Champon authorized the formation of a joint venture between his government and Gottlob Alberta, GmbH and Co. of Germany to establish the New Plan Ghana Limited. The company was officially inaugurated in December 12, 1974. He partnered the Germans to put up the bus manufacturing plant in Mass New Plan. It was the first bus manufacturing plant in West Africa. Echampon always had a soft spot for women. He believed in his heart that they possessed superior entrepreneurial spirit and therefore saw the need to empower them. And so in 1973, one of his aides, Samuel K. Danson, led a team to conduct a research which concluded that women were better at loan repayment and also had better multiplying effect with loans. This convinced a champion to grant women access to loans for businesses. Wives of military officers were not exempted from this wave of women empowerment. Women rose to prominent entrepreneurs during his regime. As a result, people started to spread gossips about womanizing at the corridors of power. Women who were driving BMW Golf produced by Kowus were ridiculed that they exchanged their buttocks for cars, which became so popular in the Ghanaian Akan language for Otto Golf. Yeah, I know, I know there was a deliberate attempt to help women entrepreneurs. Um, and that was um, 
what drove, you know, maybe you see lots of women driving girls. Because there's lots of entrepreneur, women who are entrepreneurs doing very well. You know, because if, and this was an association that, you know, he was giving to them for sexual favors. If you look at it, is it physically possible that all these women driving golfs could have had affairs with him? You know, it was, like I said, it was a deliberate attempt to help women businessmen. And if you ask people in that era, a lot of Ghanaian women business, women came up a lot, doing lots of things. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's almost disrespectful to women saying without, you know, that sort of uh, sexual favor, they couldn't have got in what they got. Um, it, was, it was really a deliberate attempt to help women entrepreneurs. One popular policy of the Champions government was Operation Feed Yourself. This initiative allowed Ghanaians to feed themselves without importing food. Nobody has ever done anything like that before. Up to today, nobody has succeeded in doing what he did. Because Ghana exported food for the first time in thousands of tons. And we have never exported food since then. He had the belief that uh, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could use our agriculture well because he had just he had done, come from Fort Leavenworth Staff College in the U.S. And incidentally, this is a military academy of the highest and one of the highest institutions in the world. Some of the people who have been there include General, the Attorney General, Seth Obin, the former CDS, uh, you have uh, the two, uh, Major General, uh, uh, he's dead now, Okan, okay. and of course, General Chamber. And there, it is, I can, in, I can tell you that the course content is about someone doing his masters, and he passed. That is how come he has PSC after his name, past Staff College. Not many military officers have that. Yeah. But that is just to give you the flavor of how he got the idea of the patient feeder. So he says he in Kansas, he realized that most of the year, most part of the year, it's uh, uh, winter, winter or winter type of uh, weather. Yet they were able to grow wheat. It was one of the important wheat growing states in the US. So he asked himself, we have the sun all year. We have rains that we could do about let's do something with, except that we have dry season. If we are able to develop some uh, irrigation to support uh, because we can do a lot. That is how he told me he got the idea of operating for yourself. I worked closely with Kenya Banasu. And you know, we're having various food joints, I mean, uh, places where we are, we are doing exhibitions. I was going with him with all the exhibitions. And then I sent him to Ufiasi, 36 villages. And you know, no government official has been to Kofiasi before. And by the way, the road from Yamuase to Kofiasi, it was I opened it for 13 years. It was nobody was passing. No way. From Kofiasi to Nilasu, 18 years. The road was open. The first time I was going, I was in front of the vehicle, I was I was directing the vehicle. And even though I was only a regional manager, I went to the regional office where Bedu was then the, 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 the uh, regional commissioner. And I said, I wanted a grader. So what he told the uh, regional administrative officer was that, this one, if he comes here, wants anything, I want not want trouble. Please, just give it to him for you to have your peace. So they gave me the grader to all, even though it was also part of my job. But I was to bring food items to Accra. If I don't open the route to where the food items were, how could I, our vehicles bring the food to Accra? So they had to obey. So we opened. Then we went, I sent him to Kofiasi, and he, they had a door bar for him, and the food 
we were hauling the food, we were, you know, from the, those villages to Accra. And then I brought Salome also to Kufiasi. The, he was then Minister of Health. And so we, uh, the maternity home, we read where Fevi did, you know, and did all that. And then the water tower. I went to the American Embassy, spoke to them, and the American Embassy, they, they have an ambassador's fund. He also used the ambassador's fund for open day to build a, a water tower for them. So that was all part of the operation Feed Yourself to bring people to, to the land. And we travel all over the country, you know, urging people to, to do their farms, urging people to bring the food items forward for it to be returned. I have so many depots in Kumasi where the, the people were coming and they were sending. I, I had the ex, you know, I had the opportunity to give them extra permits, permits. And I could have, like I said, I could have abused that to make money for myself. No, but not one person. Another was Operation Feed Your Industry. Through these operations, Ghana succeeded in clearing $117 million out of $180 million debt that NLC inherited from the Buzia administration. He had a Operation Feed Your Industries, which was going to be to develop from once you get the agriculture base, then you can get into food processing and other things and you know, it was, it was in, in, in line. Now what I find interesting is that this man has been dead about 45 minutes, 45 years. For years nobody knew that even some of us was around. We didn't matter. But I can tell you by the grace of God in the past few years I have had two pro one professor from Harvard come to this house to ask me about General Champa. You know the professor that you have here. He has been here. We have talked a lot. He interviewed me at length. There have been even my former boss, Sam Jonah, occasionally at the corner. So all these things that I hear of General Champa, are they really true? And I took the opportunity to let him get a feel of things. You see then, the philosophers have been saying that there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. I think the time has come for the world to know the real General Ignatius Kutu Achempo. On public housing, landlords at the time took advantage of the housing shortage to demand exorbitant rental prices. To address the hardships of tenant, the NLC decided to find a solution that was considered strategic. Kenori Champon decreed, through a press conference, the reduction of rent which began on 1st February 1973. Further, it was part of its housing strategy to build state houses across the country. This plan began with the establishment of the Bank for Housing and Construction BHC to provide financial backbone to the development of housing for Ghanaians. In Accra, the Dunsman project, which began with the construction of 1,000 houses, was envisaged to be the largest public housing in West Africa. Also introduced were the housing estates in Teshinungwa, the development of Jolo, North Legon, and East Legon residential areas. He also knew water was an essential commodity. To improve water supply, the Ghana Water and Sewage Corporation launched a giant dam project in 1977, the Wager Waterworks. This reservoir was designed to provide a crown metropolitan area with enough water for the next 40 years, estimated to cost 20 million cities, equivalent to $20 million at the time. This was a joint venture between the Champions government and the World Bank.
And then we have the uh, uh, SAC, State House of Corporation also there, to build the house. So all you have to do is put up bonds that would uh, uh, be given to SAC to build the houses. And then you give a mortgage to all the civil servants and what is on that. And here, you build a whole uh, township. In Kumasi, 200 acres of land was acquired at Bokro near the airport for development into a first class residential area akin to Accra's airport residential area. As part of his long term plan for industrialization, Akosumbo Dam has started flagging its inadequacy to cater for the growing population. Kenei Champon authorized the tendering in 1976 for the construction of the second hydro project. On the southern end of the Volta Lake, he cut a sword for work to begin on a 160 megawatt capacity pond dam on 30 November 1976, and works completed five years later in 1982. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see that glorious moment. Other achievements include the following. At the time when Nigeria was reported to have failed in shifting from left to right hand driving of the road, under the leadership of Kenel Ichampon, Ghana successfully shifted to right hand driving without chaos. Brigadier Fred Akofo was the head of the committee that ensured the success of the initiative of 4th August 1974. As you are aware, the change from left to right hand traffic was successfully launched at 6 a.m. on the 4th of August, exactly two months today. The changeover to date has been smooth. Accidents connected with it, I'm happy to inform you, have been insignificant, bearing in mind the magnitude of the operation. It is interesting to note that the overall national accident rate has rather dropped, obviously as a result of people being more careful than normal. Figures recorded during the month of August this year, as compared to those of last year, bear an adequate testimony to this assertion. While last year, the Ghana police recorded 1,153 vehicle accidents for the month of August. The comparative figure for this year, August, was 893. This showed a drop of 25% in vehicle casualty rate. In the area of education, a champion set up the Jobo Committee in 1972 to review the structure and content of education. Among the recommendations from the committee included delineating the boundaries of kindergarten, primary, junior secondary school, and lower senior upper senior secondary schools. He also built the Efiokobi and Pimgel Senior High School at Trouble in the Ashanti region. I'm Abigail Ifemensa, the assistant administration, the assistant headmistress administration. The school was named Treb Achumamai Secondary and now it's Ifia Kubi Ampim Senior High Girl School. Yes, the little I know about the school is that it was built by the former 
or late President Achamba. It will interest you to know that he attended basic school in Trebum. That's the traditional home. And the idea was to join Trebum and feed him. That is where the parents come from. So he started building this school between the two towns so that it would be a very big tourist town for the whole nation. We are very proud to be associated with uh, the president. The school is now being adapted by the Otun folk, so it's still a traditional and a historic uh, school. We have around 3,450 students, girls, not all girls here. We are inviting all well wishes to come down here. We offer science, home economics, visual arts, and our students are really doing well. They are decent, they are respectful, and discipline is on high. We are inviting all to come and support, and also just come and have a look at our nice, creamy nature of the school. Students who cannot be great, 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 great. Uh, remember people like Kofi Annan who became so trained on the system. You understand? So the education policy continued very well. We tried at the second stage to try to reduce it a bit in terms of the secondary schools and all. Because the secondary schools also were paying for in terms of cocoa scholarships. Those who were clever were giving cocoa scholarships. I myself I went to actual school with the cocoa scholarship. I didn't pay anything. But others pay. Education was only free in the north. In the rest South and everywhere else, everybody paid, but then you get a cocoa scholarship. You know, people like us got a cocoa scholarship. And it was expensive. Education was very expensive. Ashamu would have liked to reduce it. And I suggested to him that if he stopped all the uh, all this massive boarding schools all over the place that Kwame Kuma had built as a mistake following that water, that water model. Everywhere in the world, everybody goes to school in their own neighborhood. Day school, from home, you go to school. When you get to university, then you go to a hostel, you go, but more, you go to school, you know, and it's all free. He recognized every sector of the economy as key to development. Therefore, through arts and culture, he promoted some of his policies through the most watched program at the time, or Sofo Dazi Drama Group, which was an Akan drama group. Until this day, it is considered to be the most successful drama series to hit the Ghanaian TV screens. Creator of the group, Joris Wattenberg, shares more on how he met a champion. Uh, well, he came to my house one day and um, just asked for me. At the time, I was writing the Osobrazi series on television, so um, I was quite well known. So he just popped into the house and asked for me. As we come to the castle after that, and we uh, became friends and he wanted me to be involved in, uh, in his work. And so that's how I started. Writer of the Oscar Dance series, I had a producer director, and I was in Brad. But yes, he had the right idea. This is a right vision. Uh, in government, one of the most important things you need is communication, the ability to communicate with people. The ability to make people answer to your vision and help you to achieve whatever it is that you wanted to achieve. And the best person you need for that is a guy who's creative, who can influence people. And I was the, that guy because the entire country came to watch the soldiers program every Sunday. Everywhere stopped, everything stopped. And we were being influenced by the stories that I was writing. And therefore, it was a very good idea for him to say, why don't you, uh, you know, like, operation for yourself, the good things about it. Even when we were doing the uh, change over from left to right, I was the one who did the, so together with the general I was the one who did the script, you know, for everybody to watch and see. And it was a very smooth change over. Because people watched the program, saw what they had to do, 
and it was very simple. And they had just like Obijifi and other programs were very successful because they were being pushed by, by my, by my uh, television program. So it was a very, very, very good visionary idea. A champion respected traditional authorities. He believed getting close to them will get him closer to the people. And so he always graced his presence at various traditional events. He was even honored in one of such events. Sport was another area of well-being. To improve sport generally, the existing stadiums were refurbished and a new Kanishi Sport Complex, which would later be known as Azuma Nelson Sport Complex, was built in Accra. And the champions regime, Ghana became the first African country to win the African Cup for the third time and to keep it for good. Again in 1975, David Quartet Poison, known to many as DK Poison, won Ghana's first World Boxing Championship by beating Rubin Olivares to become World Boxing Council's featherweight in California, USA. A champion authorized the SMC to buy him a brand new car and also to build a house for him at Teshinungwa Estate. He presented the National Honor of Grand Medal and an amount of 100,000 cities equivalent of $87,000 at the time. Although DK Poison was his favorite sport personality at the time. DK Poison was his favorite sports person. But in saying that, if he was alive, my son Charlie would have been his favorite sports person. But if he was alive today, he would have been more prouder of his own grandson Charlie Pepper, a former Ghanaian American football superstar who played for Green Bay Parkers and won the Super Bowl XLV with them in 2011, with an unbeatable record of being the only player to have recorded double digit tackles. Since my grandfather passed in 79 and I was born in 83, obviously we never got to meet. However, I kept hearing the same constant things about him, you know, since he was a military general, he was an extremely strong leader, but he was also very genuine, genu generous, uh, big hearted, and very friendly. Just like the grandfather, his patriotism is beyond measure. You know, I, I always play to honor my heritage, my ancestral country the name on my back, especially, you know, their Champong name and Pepper name. He, he inspired me knowing about him growing up. He inspired me to not be average, to know that I had greatness in my family line. So for sure, when I played, I definitely kept that in the back of my mind and I couldn't just settle for average. I had to be great, do great things. So there's no question that when I played, you know, I, I definitely played to honor him. A champion was truly the man of the people. Various sporting disciplines were organized under his regime.
on foreign policy, a champion always maintained neutral position. Thus enabled him to reach both the Eastern and Western Bloc countries, even though Buja's policy of neglect had almost frozen Ghana's relations with the Eastern Bloc. But the champion managed to make amends with them. In no time, some leaders began to show solidarity by visiting Accra. Among them included Hungarian President in 1973 and Yugoslavian Prime Minister in 1976. His diplomacy and him a lot of visits from other leaders around the world. Also, in 1974, Kennedy Champon applauded the World Council of Churches in Accra for opposing racism and colonialism. The World Council of Churches, as others before them, has no choice but to oppose the racism and burden the national life of South Africa, and we applaud them for this. We also salute the World Council for the bold stand it has taken in favor of independence of, for oppressed people in Africa. I cannot see how the World Council could be true to its ideals if it did not reject any form of domination and colonialism since that these are not in tune with the message of human dignity and self-respect proclaimed by Christ. We are proud in this regard to note that the World Council fully shares one of the tenets of Ghana's foreign policy, that of freedom for territories in Africa still under colonial rule. As a Pan-Africanist, he continuously promoted his self-reliance program to the rest of the African countries so they can also be dependent solely on themselves instead of foreign donors. Together with other African leaders like Yasinbe Yadimel Togo, Yakubu Gwan of Nigeria and others, a champion champion, the formation of the economic community of West African state ECOWAS. After consolidating various agreements and protocols, in Anglophone and Francophone West African countries to form an economic bloc, the ECOWAS Treaty was signed by 15 founding heads of state at a meeting in Lagos on 25th May 1975. Yeah, he was quite instrumental in the formation of ECOWAS together with the Nigerian leader at the time, I think. And um, they, they really, you see, that's why I'm saying when it comes to African politics, he was. Very, in a very interesting way, it was just like Nkrumah. Whereas Nkrumah was more into continental unity. But Champon thought that at least if the sub regional countries in West Africa can come together and form that block, it can lead towards a continental unity. So he was very strong. He and the Nigerian leader were the stalwarts in the formation of uh, ECOWAS at the time. And I think it was part of the vision he had for. Africa's development or Ghana's development vis a vis the development of the rest of the country. By 1975, deteriorating socioeconomic conditions and popular disenchantment was ruffling the National Redemption Council, NLC. The regime's weakness and increasing ineptitude were badly exposing the Ghana Armed Forces as a whole to public riot. Ghana, when, when OPEC came into, into existence and the price of uh, oil, crude oil, rose up from $3 all the way up to $30, at the time, Ghana was importing 30,000 barrels of oil per day for the needs of the country to turn into petrol, diesel, etc., etc. This was costing us about $38,500,000 per year because uh, we were buying oil at the time at about $3 per barrel. So 30,000 barrels of oil per day times $3 times 365 days. 
days a year amounted to about $38,500,000 billion that we're spending. The country was making about $300 million, so this was a very comfortable situation. You know, we're making about $300 million exporting cocoa, timber, gold, etc. Now, when the price of oil went up all the way up to about $30, we're now spending over $385 million a year instead of $38,500,000. $385 million a year more than 80 million dollars above the total amount of money we're making from our own exports that was how the balance of payments became naturally when you add the other imports we spend that much money buying crude oil then we go to go and buy milk sugar tinapa sardine all those things and we're spending about 900 million dollars importing products for the country's benefit and it was just unsustainable this is what in the end brought down our champions government inflation and price price uh, price inflation that 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 on, on the back of shortage of goods that was just impossible to contain because we, you simply didn't have enough money practically like today in the absence of political position, public pressure came primarily from civil society groups. A champion abruptly dissolved the NLC on 9 October 1975. In place of the NLC, Kennedy Champon constituted the Supreme Military Council SMC, as the highest administrative and legislative body, retaining the position of head of state and getting promoted to the rank of a general. I was not here when the SMC thing took place. But the only thing I could say, um, the, 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 the thing was just that um, the, 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 the junior members of his government, when I say junior members in rank, I go back and whatnot, you know, um, were not showing the right respect to their commanders. Ever since they all became government ministers, they thought, you know, they were the highest people and so no matter who you are, you must give them the, that respect. And so they were not, and this annoyed the commanders. That was why when I was in government with him, I said that my commanders should remain in their post and that those officers, Agbo, Ba, and Solomon, should hand over their commands. They should not be commanding their units and at the same time be members of the NRC. I was reluctant, but I forced it through and I took other officers to take over their commands and left them to be solely NRC members. They didn't like it. They abused me. In the end, I called my party and said, Yako Koski, well done. I like what you did. He called the party, you know, but he couldn't confront them. You see the point? Was it indeed the right move to uh, make it? Yeah, I'm like we're calling. A champion was under intense pressure, not only from the civilian sector, but from within the armed forces. But the NRC excluded the service commanders. It was just a champion and some colonels and majors. The service commanders who were generals and commanding the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force were not included. So, they were threatening some kind of severe or dire consequences if the changes were not made. So he changed it from NRC to SMC, bringing into the government all the service commanders. So that was a tactical move to kind of uh, uh, to, to, to stop a potential threat that was coming from the senior officers. This move by General Echampon was leading to his ultimate Death. On the radio that he had been defeated together with Abi Kutuka, I was flabbergasted. It was, it was a terrible time. But then he knew it, didn't he? I mean, 
But the year before that, the uh, Kufu government had been trying to convince him to fly out of the country and go into exile in London or America or something. He said, kept saying to them, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be there next year, together with all of you. <laughs> oh yeah, and people like Sai Baba, that, you know, we used to go and see Sai Baba in India, and a whole bunch of other spiritual leaders all over the place. All that. And they knew that he so would die at the time. thought that the senior officers were making money out. But one thing people didn't understand about the whole thing was that, Mr. Harris, when I a chamber made the coup, we sent a lot of military guys into civilian appointments. Listen to what I'm saying. I trust you now. <coughs> we sent a lot to military appointments. Not only officers, other ranks too. Whereas we left a lot also in the camp. And those in the camp were seeing their mess, going to these appointments, military, come back, dressing well, extra money in their pockets, and living. And these were the guys that befriended General Rodgers and poisoned this man. These chaps were doing this, living well. You, you get my point? Not many people know the number of people who died out of this uh, coup. People being thrown from helicopters into the sea. They don't know. I will know. I'm a serious, so I know. I know from this city. So, that is what happened. So we forgot to rotate these chaps. So some people sat down in the barracks, defending you, like Achampo, and the government from attacks. While these their mates are going into town, chop civilian jobs, make money, come home, and bluffing you back. You know soldiers. He sees Kwame, he goes, he comes back, he's riding a motorcycle when he didn't have a bicycle before, and all that sort of thing. Those are some of the things that happened that made Jerry School. The boys jumped on him, we want to clear these people. You, you get me? Not many people know this. 